Hello, so today's video is going to be on something quite interesting. It's retrofitted retro technology, so I'll get into that in a minute because I'm more familiar with the old one than this new one. And when I say new, it's not really new. Also, the 13 o'clock podcast t-shirt arrived today that um, they sent me because I'm a Patreon of theirs. Check them out if you don't know the channel. If you're into true crime and sort of paranormal shit, you'll probably find it really fascinating. But anyway, this video is going to be about this. So. On the side, what this technically is called is a meter dose rate MD3 equipment, and there's a serial number. Now, I don't know how well the lighting will show this, but you might be able to see behind that text is the old bit of text of it. Because this is a Mark II Radiac, and it seems the British Army was so poorly funded with a lot of NBC equipment, that what they ended up doing was, when they needed a new kind of radiation bit of detecting equipment, rather than them actually being given something proper, new and good, they said, let's get a load of old Mark II Radiacs from the 1950s, update them slightly, or to be, although to be fair it is actually quite a good update, and I'll show you some photos of the inside in a minute so you can see um, how it differs, and then what you can do is, um, you know, keep, carry on using them for longer and longer. So, let's open things. So it comes in this lovely old, really strong vinyl case. Uh, so we'll open that, it has a lovely old smell to it. Um, and what you get in here is this. So, there's the labels on it. Look closely at those. So it says it, this one belongs to the RAF. And, interesting enough, they at least had this in service in either 2002 or 2003. So, that gives you some idea. Now, it says 1991 on that there. So, I'm assuming in the 90s, when the Cold War ended, they upgraded, started an upgrade program from the Mark II Radiacs into what were known as these MD3s, or whatever they called them. But, fundamentally, it's a Mark II Radiac. So, like, let's talk about Britain's awful development of um, Geiger counters and things like that to get started, to give you some idea of background if you don't know. So, let's say America had all that cool CDV equipment for um, civil defence, you know, like the CDV 700 Geiger counters, CDV uh, 715 and 720 sort of ionisation chambers, you know, they had all sorts of different stuff, and the US military had different stuff as well. Um, the Soviets had lots of military and civil defence stuff as well. Britain, uh, we're ignoring stuff like mini monsters, like actually good made for scientific industry stuff, just as in what the military or civil defence would have had in the Cold War. They had something which was called the Mark I Radiac, I believe, or just the Radiac, and that was a low range Geiger counter, fair enough, you know, most nations have that. Then they replaced them with something called the Mark II Radiac, and this is primarily what this is going to be. Um, Mark II Radiac was eventually replaced by, I think it's called something like the PDR 82, which was. Um, like a dose rate meter to scimitar, I've got one on order, when it arrives I'll do a video on it. Um, but we didn't build much of anything, and the only actual proper Geiger counter we built, as far as I'm aware, was the Mark I. Uh, the, the PDR-82, whatever it was called, the Plessy device, that might have been a Geiger counter as well, I can confirm that when I get one, I can look at the guts of it and see how it works. These are not Geiger counters, these are ion chambers, as in ionisation chambers. How these work is you've essentially got a box there, um, that's got an electric field that's strong on one side, weak on the other, or, you know, positive, negative. When gamma rays go in, it reads them. However, this is quite a good device because it actually reads um, alpha and beta as well, as just gamma. So, the closest thing I can compare this to is probably the CDV720, the one with the beta shield, um, you know, on the bottom, which I'll get around to doing a video on, because I've got one now. Um, but anyway, to go on the history of these, they made a lot for Civil Defence and Royal Observer Corps and all that. Cold War ended. Um, and they kind of retrofitted them. I didn't even know about this till I was been after a Mark II for ages, then I found out there were these newer versions. Now, if you're going to get one of these, I'd recommend this one, just because there's a few quality of life improvements. When I show you the pictures later on in the video of what the internal circuitry and all that looks like, they've actually updated a lot of that. So, these are better retrofitted than I thought, at least this one is. Um, they also changed how the batteries work, which is a massive plus. So in here, it now only takes two batteries. One for the light, which doesn't work in mine, and I've tried different light bulbs, so I think it's probably just something's broken on the inside and I can't be asked to fix it. But one for the light and one for the actual device itself, so you only need two diesel batteries. Um, the old Radiax took two diesels, I think a 15 volt and a 30 volt. There's a channel, I think it's called Dexter's Lab, and it might have some numbers after it. He's done quite a good video tearing apart, like doing a teardown of one of the old Mark II Radiax. Um, they didn't have anything to test it with, but they show you sort of all the components inside. So check out his video if you want to see somebody, you know, taking a Mark II apart. Um, so the this, this controls to this are very simple. You've got your zeroing switch there, um, which you adjust with a screwdriver. Then you've got an off switch, 
uh, your range selection, I'm um, sorry, the range and the zero is on this one. And then you've got off battery test, where basically you can tell if your batteries are working and if they're at the right voltage to operate the device. Um, on with lamp, and that's just on for me, because the lamp doesn't work, and on. So on with lamp and on are basically the same thing on my device. So what I'll do in a moment is show you what these switches do, because the lovely thing with these old iron chamber devices is the switches are actually really cool. So let's first do the one that just turns it on. So that's the battery test. And I will say the contacts, I don't think, are quite tight in there. So I think it turns off and on if it's not kept the proper way up. But anyway, so let me just turn that off and on again. I might have to actually redo some of these things on, because I reckon one of these screws might be a bit loose, because he's... He was doing this earlier, he was working fine yesterday, and then all of a sudden, doesn't want to power on. So I reckon the contact's a bit loose somewhere. That's a bit annoying, of course, as soon as I try and do a video. Right, let me play about with him a second, and I will resume the video when I get him going. Right, it was as simple as opening the battery compartment and closing it again, so I guess one of the battery contacts was a bit weak. But anyway... So that's it turned on, so what you can do is you go to battery test first of all, you know, check it's in the area it's meant to stop, then you go to on or on with lamp, and then you have your range selection and zero. So the range selection is pretty cool, they've changed it from Ronkens to um, Centigrays on this one, but they're quite a close unit. Um, centigrays like the Sievert type one, so you've got your zero to three Centigray, zero to thirty Centigray, and 0 to 500 centigrade, and they're quite nicely colour coded, so that one's grey, it's fine apparently, it's the not great, not terrible level. The green one, oh, it's not really green, um, 30 centigrade is a pretty scary number, and then that's red, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I mean the red one's actually pretty correctly done. And then you've got the zero one, which is just basically where you put it to the zero one, you then calibrate it with the zero knob to get, you know, the zero on the zero, and you're good to go. So, I'm going to pop this down now because it's like a lot of iron chamber devices. Um, weirdly, these work a lot better. Um, so you've got a crotch shot there with this in between my legs, very strange. Anyway, let me turn that round that way for you, so you can see the display properly. And then, what I'll do, if I tighten the camera up there, put this back here, zoom in a bit, we can have a look at the display. So, yeah, that's that, and the zero is on to zero, and I'm pretty sure if I got it set back to... Nope. Right, let's put him back on there. So that's the lowest setting. So what I'm going to do now is demonstrate how to calibrate this. Now, because these are scary high range numbers, a centigrade, there's a hundred centigrades in a grey. A grey is the same as a sievert, basically. That's an oh shit level of radiation. One sievert is 114 Rontgen. I'm pretty sure, although I haven't checked this recently, um, I think the scale on the old Mark IIs was 0 to 5 Rontgen, 0 to 50, and 0 to 500. Uh, so this is technically a slightly lower range, which is actually better for most people, because it means it's a bit more sensitive. Um, to give you some idea, there is, I think each centigrade is 1.14 Rontgen. So, basically, rather than being 0 to 5 Rontgen now, if you were doing it in the Rontgen numbers, 1 would be 1.14, 2 would be 2.28, and 3 would be, does that be 3.42? If my maths is correct, 3.42 Rontgen. So it goes up to 342 Rontgen rather than 500 Rontgen, assuming I'm imagining that was correct. So at the front, if I just quickly show you, there's two things. There's this thing that just holds a bit of silica gel on like a pole um, to keep it all dry inside. Now there's this thing. This is the alpha window. You open that, and you look directly into the ionization chamber. So let's do that. So let's get that open. And then what you'll see in here is basically that's looking into the iron chamber. It doesn't look very special because iron chambers aren't all that interesting, as I said, but you can actually use this to calibrate this, and you can actually just use it to test it's even working if you've got one, or you these yourself, and because you can use something very simple. simple. So here we go, a bit of a Mericinium 241. What's in a lot of smoke alarms? Hang on, if the camera wants to autofocus. Don't know if it will or not, let me put my hand there. There you go, that's sort of focusing. Mericinium 241. But watch what happens. If I get the AM241 and I put that in front of the little bit where the alpha window is, see that? Because it's a very strong alpha emitter, so where it's shooting alpha directly into the iron chamber, it will move the um, number. Now, if you have a bigger bit of AM241, obviously you'll get a bit more of an interesting result with this. Also, a thing to note is um, 
I think their actual proper calibration tools for this are almost like a pencil or like a pen made out of a mericinium. So they could just essentially push it directly in, I assume the further you pushed it in, the higher the reading went. But just to show you that's just not it shorting the system or something and making the needle move that way, um, it is actually making, uh, I don't know if you can see it that well with my hand there, let me do it there. Um, before I even make contact with it, that is registering it. And it, this is me pushing it right against it. Um, but, you know, even when I'm not physically contacting it, you can see that needle moving. So the re that's really cool of these, because at least you can tell your iron chamber's working, because with a lot of things like CDV 715 and 720s, unless you've got a massive bit of Cobalt 60 or like um, Cesium 137, you're not going to even actually notice if um, they're working. So yeah, there you go. So we know it works, because it's registering the mericinium. So what we're going to do is close that bit back up, but yeah, you can detect alpha radiation with this, which is pretty bloody cool, because a lot of iron chamber devices, although the iron chamber themselves can actually detect, you know, alpha radiation, the devices are set up in such a way where you can never get alpha radiation into the iron chamber, because the iron chamber's, you know, kept deep in the device. So, that's that. So, the only other bit really worth showing you now is the beta window. And I'm going to show you all the documents that came with it in a minute, because I've not really looked at those properly, so there might be something interesting in there. So, what we're going to do is, I'm going to leave it turned on for now, um, that is where the lamp goes in, that bit, that's pretty boring, so there's a lamp on a pole that doesn't work on mine, but I've changed the bulb, so I don't think it's the bulb. And right, underneath, uh, and I'd need a smaller screwdriver than I've currently got for this, so I am going to bodge it with a knife, which is never a good idea, but uh, we'll see what goes wrong, horribly wrong. Okay, so, where is my knife on my Swiss Army knife? There it is, I want this little one. Um, this is the most awkward beta cover thing I've ever seen, or beta, however you want to pronounce it, because basically, on lots of these, if they did something cool, they'd have, like, the CDV720 idea. And what that is, is where you've got a sliding cover that, like, ratchets open or close for, you know, beta or gamma. This one, you have to undo a load of screws to the bottom of the device to actually get at them. You know, which isn't really handy, is it? But, you know, whatever. So, you know, but you're probably never going to really want to use it with this opened. Um, but, you know. I will show you what's under there, so I'm just going to waffle on a bit more. So yeah, these weren't bad devices by any means, but they were just a bit obsolete, really. Um, and I mean, if you consider how good you can have, like, modern electrical Geiger counters and things, like the little digital ones, if you get a decently high-end one, um, it just seems very strange the British Army, you know, didn't upgrade to that. Or maybe just m build more of those Plessies, but, you know, maybe Plessy went out of business, I don't know. So basically all I'm just going to do, obviously, is... While I waffle on, open up this. And again, it, if I went and got my screw, screwdriver set, it'd be a bit easier. But essentially, at the bottom, you've either got your aluminium or steel little sort of um, case. That's all it is, basically. Little base plate. And what this covers up is the switch for beta or gamma. Now, I'm assuming they keep this on here because it stops you accidentally damaging the beta window. So what we'll do now is hopefully that's starting to come off. And again, it's one of those slightly awkward things of, um, you know, not all the screws, because they're rusted and a bit old, want to move properly. And I'm not using a proper screwdriver, so there's quite a lot of reasons why that's like that. But I'd rather you see me take it off in real time, so you know, you know, I'm not messing you about with this. Now, can I zoom this out any further, or is this fully zoomed out? Oh, it will zoom out a bit more. Right, so let's get this off. So that's one screw starting to move a bit. But basically, yeah, you've got a little base plate on here. Um, oh shit, held my Swiss Army knife the wrong way. Not a good idea. Good thing I've got a tetanus injection, because otherwise, um, you know, you always wonder with like really rusty screws. Or I do, anyway. Uh, so anyway, I imagine a lot of people are just skipping through this part of the video, and I'd actually advise you to if you were a normal person watching it. So there we go, right, this is starting to move now, so it's just two more screws I need to get off, which are rusted and don't want to move. But what we'll have under here, once I get these moving, right, hopefully this back side one is going to move, and then I can just rotate the entire thing off and show it you. Yeah, here we go. So, what's going to happen now, is hopefully I can do this. And this, you, you would not believe the smell that comes out of here. It's not an unpleasant smell, but it's a weird old surplus smell. Um, 
very, very strong smell. It, it kind of smells like some sort of solvent or, um, you know, it's hard to describe. Of course, that screw doesn't want to come up, so I'm going to have to get this one off. And again, knife the wrong way. That's why I like lock knives, because it's harder to do that. But yeah, I think at some point I might actually just totally replace the screws I've got on this, because, um... I know I'm not using a proper screwdriver at the moment, but these are really kind of, you know, dodgy cross-threaded old screws. Right, hopefully this one is finally starting to turn. Yeah, it's one of those ones where it actually seems to be easier to twist the entire kind of plate around with it, but okay, so hopefully I can get him out with my hand now if he's yeah, there we go. So what will happen is we'll lift that off. Right. Now this is the bit I was trying to show you. So I assume they keep that base plate on there because it's just more durable having it on. You've got a little metal clip system that basically allows you to flip this cover. So you've got either here a bit of aluminium or steel. Um, actually that might be very thick plastic. No, I think it is some sort of metal. But anyway, what this does is there's your beta window. So that's got like some sort of celluloid layer or something. So a bit of plastic. And this basically flips. So if you had it in this position, that is where it reads beta and gamma through the bottom. And obviously when it's in this position, it reads only gamma because the beta window is blocked. However, what you'd probably do most of the time is just have this base plate on here. Because if you wanted to read alpha beta as well, you could just open that little front port as well. Um, which makes it a lot easier to do. Because um, the problem with these devices, even if I had the beta bit open, is quite often even if you're trying to put them on quite a strong beta source, because iron chambers kind of drift slightly when you've got air going in them, as you can see what's going on with that needle there. It's quite hard to tell if it's actually the source doing it, or just you going like that with your hand as you're trying to put it on top. But yeah, so that is um, what they essentially called the MD3, I think was the name of it, wasn't it? Yep, MD3. What that stands for, oh, meter dose rate. So this is meter dose rate free, but what you need to really know is it's a Mark II Radiac. They retrofitted. So at the end of the video, I'll include some pictures of what the insides actually look like, because I'm sure you don't want me to mess around with a screwdriver or a knife even longer trying to open that. So let's put that back on. Let's flick him off. Um, but yeah, this is it's a lot nicer than I thought, and I do really appreciate that you can actually zero it, or not zero it, sorry, um, you know, test it with a bit of a mericinium. Um, that is a nice feature. And you could also actually use it as an alpha detector if you really wanted to as well, which is nice. So yeah, let me get this um, back on. But yeah, this is the worst bit of it by far, is just the awful bottom section. Because, you know, so many of these sort of things, they've just gone, oh, um, you know, let's have a sliding cover. And that's all they actually had to do. Or well, they could have had like a really durable hinge there, but no. It's literally, this thing is a steel box. Um, but it's cool, you know. These are nice bits of retro equipment, and it's, I don't know how I feel about that, because, you know, they've kept an old piece of equipment in service for ages, but at the same time, you know, it's it kind of says a lot, doesn't it, about, um, you know, how screwed you are if you have to rely on this sort of stuff. I've just realised this cover actually goes one way and not the other, look, so if I put it this way, that will line up properly. Silly me. Um, but yeah. It looks like it's a one piece size bit, but now the screws do actually go into slightly different positions. Um, so yeah, there's that. Right, let's have a quick look at the instruction manual. Well, not the instructions, but all the paperwork that came with it and see if there's anything interesting in there. Okay, so let's first look at this little card. So this actually says operating instructions. So I guess there are instructions, but anyway, let me quickly read them myself. So, ah yeah, it's literally just kind of what I've explained in the video. So, no point really showing much of that. Pause that if you want to read it, but it's literally just what I've said and is obvious from looking at it. Um, and, yeah, here's just some stuff, you know. It says, warning, switch instrument off before replacing batteries. Guess that's a good idea or anything, really. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's all that says. But, yeah, here's the more interesting thing. Uh, it looks like a service record or something like that. I haven't read all this, so there might be some really cool stuff in here. It might be really, really boring, so let's have a look. So, Certificate of Calibration, ooh. So, 
of a radiation protection instrument issued by DSTL Radiological Protection Service. I'll flip this around so you can read it in a second. I just obviously need to read it this way. Institute of Naval Medicine. Um, it was calibrated on 14th of March 03 uh, for RAF Honington. I don't know where that is without looking on the map. Customer address, Bury St. Edmund, Suffolk. Oh, so I guess, yeah, RAF Hol um, Hornington is in Bury St. Edmund, Suffolk. And there's, there's their thing. And it passed, so there we go, it worked. Um, so they tested it with cesium 137, that's 137CS. Um, and the observed reading was 35.0 centigrade. Ooh, that's a pretty scary number. Um, so yeah. It says it was maybe the 5.6% inaccuracy thing, but yeah, it's interesting. Let me just flip that around so you can see it, but yeah. So they, they calibrated with a bit of cesium-137. I've got a bit of cesium-137, but it's certainly not one that would give you that kind of dose. Um, mine's quite boring compared to that. Anyway, um, let's have a read of what else they did. They did a visual inspection, did a calibration procedure, They didn't do any uh, temperature or pressure corrections. Limited calibration. No overload test was performed on range 0 to 300 centigrade. Range for this instrument. Do, 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 do. So, I'm not sure if they're saying that's a good thing, that's a bad thing, or whatever. I don't know enough about the technical operation of these that, you know, if you overload it or not, if it's meant to do a certain thing. But it didn't break and it passed calibration, so... Oh, and it's on about americinium-241 and cesium-37 there, blah, 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 blah. Um, let's have a look at the last page. And there's, a, yeah, an instrument thing. So, I guess what they're just saying on this sheet is there's a load of the shit they did on it. And, um, you know, just just to prove that, yeah, it passed, 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 passed. So it's kind of cool that this has been calibrated so recently, thinking, like, it's only, like, 17 years ago or so that we've had this um, device calibrated, even though it's an old Cold War monstrosity, but, like, originally from the 1950s, and they've just kept retrofitting it. But, yeah, uh, that, that's quite cool. So there you go. If you spot these on eBay, I would actually recommend buying them. Not that I think you're ever going to encounter radiation levels where you need it. But as I said, you can tell if they're working by putting a bit of americinium 241 in there and seeing if it does anything. And obviously, clearly it did. So yeah, there you go. This is an old Mark II Radiac, rebranded as an MD3, as in meter decimeter or whatever they called it. Yeah, meter dose rate, MD3. But essentially, it's a Mark II Radiac and they've retrofitted an old retro bit of Cold War tech, and they still work. These are very primitive iron chamber devices. It does say something about the state of the British military if they kept stuff like this in service for just so long. I don't know if they've even still got some more knocking about. It might have been when they came to, you know, put this one back for its next, next test. They said, oh, we couldn't be asked to do it. Let's just sell them the surplus. But yeah, so... This is a device that was probably originally made in the 1950s or 1960s that at one point was retrofitted with a centre grey display, some new electronics inside all that, but it's primarily the same shell and, you know, same old old bits of tech really, just retrofitted in places. And then they've just kept calibrating and calibrating them and calibrating them, so... Yeah, it's cool that you keep old tech working for so long. But, you know, it's a bit like if you've got an old car that keeps costing more and more and more to put through an MOT and you keep it in service that long. Would you just be better off buying a new car? Absolutely. It is a lot cool, though, to see this old retro tech in service for so long. But again, yes, what does that say about the British military that um, they are being forced to use equipment this old for this long? Probably not something good.